Over the years, us developers accumulate lots and lots of various bits of configuration in dot .files in our home folder. It's often very useful to have all this configuration portable so that you can boot up a new machine, whether it's another development machine or one of your servers with that configuration and be productive straight away. I've messed with a couple of systems for managing my dot .files and eventually I've arrived at one that I like. I like it in particular because it uses a tool I'm already familiar with, Git, and it doesn't use linking, which I always get a bit confused by. Today I'll present the entire workflow. By the end of the video, you'll know how to do the same, and also you'll know how to pull your dot .files onto a remote server and install things. I'm over here in GitHub now in my dot .files repository. Unfortunately, it's private still because I'm a little bit afraid I might leak something sensitive. Anyway, you can see the structure of my dot .files here. It has the usual suspects, things like or C files for various programs. This is a Ruby REPL. This is Postgres. This is some linter. This is Tmux, a kind of terminal manager, the vimrc and the zshrc, two of the biggies. And then some other bits and pieces like my personal theme for my terminal. It's special because it shows the exit code of every command, which I find useful. Some Git hooks and my own massive readme for how to use this or how to use all the commands on my computer. I'll go into that in more detail later. Another thing worth seeing here is that I have a bunch of files, for example, brute to install, mpmd to install, python to install, ruby to install, with packages that I expect to exist on my development machine. For example, eslint and telefence. These are often packages that are used within my editor's linters, and it's very handy to have them globally installed. Let's talk about a good way to implement a .files repository. Right now, I'm in my home folder, and we can verify that there. Let's imagine that I naively set up a Git repository here. You can see that my terminal now states that I'm in the master branch of a particular repository. That should be main by now, but I guess I've got to fix something. Anyway, now imagine I go into my downloads folder. This is just here. You can see that I'm currently in a Git repository, even though there is no Git repository here. Well, I guess I need ls-a, but it doesn't really matter. I think it's automatic. Anyway, if I remove the Git repository in my home directory like so, then you can see that the downloads folder is not a Git repo. The reason why all of this is useful is because you don't want the Git repo in your home directory that you're using for your dot .files to conflict with Git repos in your code folders and so on. That's just going to create a mess. I told you a second ago that ls is alias to ls-a. Let's prove that. You can see on the screen that this is confirmed. I ended up using a similar approach to create a command called dot .files that replaces git. Let's have a look at the exact alias. Let's unpack this a bit. The first bit you see is just a long way to refer to where the git binary is. Usually this is on the path, but here we're specifying it in full. I don't think it's completely necessary for these purposes. You can confirm it works right there. The next interesting bit here is this option flag dash dash git dir equals home slash dot dot files folder. What this is doing is telling our dot files command to store all its git internal files in the dot dot files folder. This is instead of the default git uses when you start a repo of slash dot git. Why do we do this? This is in order to enable us to simultaneously use the dot files command and also the regular git command, which you'd expect to continue working on the same machine in the same folders. The last argument here, dash dash work tree equals home, is used to ensure that our dot files alias can be used deep within the directory tree, for example, home slash code slash client name slash project, and still work correctly and intuitively. Without it, the dot .files command will believe that the files it expects to exist at certain relative directories to where you call it have been deleted, even though they exist within the home directory. I'm going to make this clearer with a couple of interactive examples. From my home directory, I'm going to go to the code directory slash oxnotes, uh, oxnotes4 rather. Now, here I'm going to call dot .files status to see what's going on. And we can see that the git hooks pre-commit file that exists two directories up has been modified. This is intuitive because I am two directories deeper within this Oxbridge notes folder. Next, let's see what happens when we run the underlying command of the alias without that work tree flag. What will come up? Here, it's a complete mess. 
we see that it believes that all of the files that still exist within my home directory have been deleted. That's because from the perspective of this nested directory, they are not present. Now you can see the reason for that extra flag within this alias. Also, to show you how this doesn't interact with Git, let me do git status within this particular piece of code. And you can see the work directory is clean. Whereas if I do dot file status, it knows that I modified one of my Git hooks back in the home directory. Let's go to the TMP folder and create a fake dot files command in order to show you how to get started. Let's walk through how to get started with your dot files repo. So what you're going to do is use git init dash dash bear, that's important, and dot files. This will initialize a repo there. If we cd into this particular repo, you'll see that there's an error thrown by my shell. You can ignore that. Now I'm going to create a variant of the dot files alias we had earlier. This one just be df2 or dot files2, and it's set up to use the dot files directory here. All right, let's give that a run and see what happens. df2 status. Okay, now we see there's quite a lot of files listed. You can imagine that if you were in your home directory instead, there might be hundreds of these particular files. That can get noisy. In order to reduce the noise, we configure this particular git alias df2 to not show untracked files. Now, when we run git status, or sorry, when we run df status, df2 status, we see nothing. So how are we supposed to add files in that case? How noisy? Well, let's go over to the home directory and have a look at how many files are within my home directory. I'm using bat in order to scroll through all the files. And you can imagine that that's going to be a pain in the ass to manage, especially considering that the vast majority of these entities, for example, my movies folder or music folder, have absolutely nothing to do with dot files. Therefore, we need a way to reduce the noise. From there, we can commit with a message and shoot that code off to GitHub, if you please. So even though this folder clearly contains many files, df2 status shows nothing. So how do we add a file? Well, why don't we try git add, and I have a fake vmrc here, and see what happens. Oops, I forgot to use the df2 alias. Let me do that now. And now let's do df2 status. You can see it was added. Next, let's show how you can get your dot files on another machine, for example, a server you're administering. So I'm going to create another directory as a subdirectory of TMP, and it's going to be just basically Jack2. And then I'm going to go into Jack2, and I'm going to clone my dot files in here. Let's try this particular clone command. Now it's downloading it from GitHub. The next thing we want to do is define the alias on the server. I know df2 is available here, but let's define df3 just to prove that it's separate. So I've prepared this particular command here and modified it to point to this tmp slash jack2 fake. Now, lastly, let's check out the code here and take a look around. You can see here that I have all my dot files pulled directly from GitHub and available on this imaginary new machine. The final step that a seasoned system administrator might use at this point is to have some scripts to install all the dependencies that they need to have on that machine for pleasant development. Instead of having to write them out like this, they might have some sort of wrapper tool like make install dev devs. The final step that fellow Vim users might consider doing is to install all your plugins using NVIM's headless mode and then calling the plug install command. Your particular plugin manager might have something else. By running this, you'll have a perfectly functional NeoVim running on your remote machine, which is a wonderful way to develop. <laughs>